для советского народа это была Великая Отечественная война. Он вел ее во имя свободы и независимости своей социалистической родины, во имя избавления Европы, да и всего мира от фашистского порабощения. 20 миллионов жизней советских людей унесла эта война. Наш народ не забудет ее никогда. Леонид Ильич Брежнев. I'm Bert Lancaster. This is the actual banner which the Russian troops planted on top of the Reichstag after they seized Berlin on April 30th, 1945. Now you see it in the museum of the Soviet armed forces in Moscow. It's a sacred Russian relic, a memory of the last deciding battle of World War II. To the Soviet army, the capture of Berlin was the culmination of their drive to avenge the ravaging of their homeland. As the Soviets were fighting their way into the heart of the city, Hitler mobilized his last reserves. Children, as young as 14 and 15, were called up to fight veteran Red Army soldiers. Hitler, Goebbels, Goering, and the other top leaders of the Third Reich had retreated to a bunker. In that underground shelter, Hitler and Goebbels took their own lives. The war against Hitler was over. The Germans had lost. The last major battle of the unknown war had been fought and peace had come to Europe. Our story, the Battle of Berlin. Across Europe in the spring of 1945, there was an air of expectancy. For a long time now, the question had been not whether Nazi Germany would be crushed, but how soon. The war was in its sixth year. For nearly four of those years, the Soviet army had first suffered, then recovered gloriously, and now was about to exert its full might against the capital of the Thousand Year Reich. its wake from the Baltic to the Black Sea, through the wide plains of Belorussia and the Ukraine, the Red Army left the wreckage of the German war machine. The Soviet High Command had completed its plans for this last battle in November 1944 was to begin on January 20th, 1945. Berlin was 75 miles away, across the River Oder. With much of their land already devastated, the Germans decided to throw everything they had left into this gigantic confrontation. They succeeded in mustering a million men, 10,000 pieces of artillery, 15,000 tanks, 3,300 aircraft, 
all protected by mile upon mile of strong fortification. The Germans meant to contest the odor and had prepared accordingly by blowing the bridges. Behind the East Bank, the Soviets massed their force. It amounted to 193 divisions, two and a half million men, 42,000 artillery pieces, 6,300 tanks, and 7,500 aircraft. In all, a superiority of between two and four to one in men and equipment. Recognizing the size of the Soviet concentration, Hitler conceived one last desperate idea. If the Red Army could be held in the East, the Americans and British might accept softer terms than unconditional surrender. But Roosevelt and Churchill had promised Stalin that Berlin would be a Soviet target. There would be no deals with the Nazis. April 2nd, Zhukov, commander of the first Belarusian front, came back from the final conference in Moscow. Stalin had given Zhukov the honor of taking the German capital. The operation was complex. In essence, Zhukov's Belarusian armies were to strike directly west to Berlin. Marshal Konyev's first Ukrainian front would head for Leipzig, then north. Rokossovsky's second Belarusian front to the north would force the Oder and advance to the Elbe. All that Nazism had promised was at stake. The glorification of the Aryan virtues, the years of racism and terror, of militarism and the brute excitement of the mob who were coming to an end. Finally, after all the conquests, it was the Gotterdammerung. All were drawn to this last act. The Nazis banded them into Volkssturm battalions. Nazi youth performed its last duties, not knowing how close extinction was. They were brave, these children, and dangerous. Hitler emerged from his bunker in the heart of Berlin to hand out decorations, offer encouragement, act the kindly father. It was Adolf Hitler's last public appearance. The message, Germany will remain German. It was a beautiful, gentle morning, with the spring sun beginning to lift the mist. 
It was April 16th, 5 a.m. Behind the first wave of the Soviet assault, they had mounted 143 searchlights to blind the enemy. Zhukov committed the rest of his armor and all of his planes. The Germans' outlying defenses were swiftly crushed, but they'd crammed men into thick defensive positions on the Zilo Heights about 30 miles from Berlin. There, the battle became most intense. The Germans rushed in anti-aircraft artillery to slow the Soviets. But on April 18th, after a two-day fight, the Red Army overran the heights. The attack on Berlin was going as planned. Marshal Konyov had developed his southern attack at speed and with success. The Soviet high command now ordered Konyov to swing two tank armies north in the direction of Berlin. In the north, Marshal Rokossovsky thrust forward. Marshal Rokossovsky's armies of the 2nd Belarusian Front forced the Oder at its branch. They had to cross two stretches of open water and two and a half miles of flooded swamps between them, all under heavy fire. Konyev Rokossovsky. Each wanted the honor of having his troops first in Berlin. Rokossovsky's assault engineers were hard pressed. By nightfall, Rokossovsky's armor was beginning to cross, to roll towards Stettin and the Elba. The Luftwaffe sent up what strength it had against the dominant Red Air Force. There were Soviet aces present. One of them, Major Kozhedub, added two kills to his total of 60. Sometimes the Red Air Force spotted American bombers on their own missions. German reinforcements were destroyed on their way forward. 
To the west, Russia's allies were across the Rhine and threatening the Ruhr. The Americans by the Remagen Bridge, the British by amphibious assault. Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill had agreed that the Western Allies would first take the bomb-ravaged cities of the Ruhr and then meet the Soviets on the Elbe. Southward, American and French spearheads would thrust for Bavaria, Czechoslovakia, and Austria. In Berlin, 400,000 civilians built barricades from the ruins of their own homes. Every street, every building was to be defended. Berlin, Zhukov knew, covered 350 square miles, all heavily fortified. At 1.50 p.m. on April 20th, the fourth day of the battle, Zhukov's long-range artillery opened fire on the city. Berlin's outer defenses began to crumble. capital, there was chaos. Normally the most submissive of people, the citizens took to the streets, driven by starvation. And intoxicated with greed, all discipline, all social order had been wiped away in the hours of fear and destruction. German armored commander commented, April 20th was the hardest day. My troops had already suffered tremendous losses. They were worn down and exhausted, no longer able to resist the tremendous thrust of the superior Russian forces. airport, the Tempelhof, scene of so many of the Nazis' welcomes and farewells to foreign dignitaries, was in Soviet hands. The Tempelhof's former commander could not believe he was a prisoner. Behind the Soviet bombardment, Zhukov's 3rd Shock Army and his 47th Army erupted into the city streets. Zhukov threw in the 1st and 2nd Guards tank armies after them.
Luftwaffe wanted to take the city by the last day of April. The 1st of May was a national holiday in Russia. And Berlin, Zhukov thought, would make the perfect present. Combat cameramen recorded every day of the battle. The struggle had raged for an entire week. At the center of the inferno, deep in the ground, inside the Hitler bunker, the author of all this misery tried to salvage something out of the disaster. Nazi leaders were still hoping for a negotiated surrender, while above them, the aspirations and the monuments of the thousand-year Reich were being consumed by flame. With the stubbornness of the doom, the Germans fought on in the wreckage of their past. center towered the Reichstag, set afire in 1933 by Nazi provocateurs so they could use the crime as an excuse for a reign of terror. In 1945, the Reichstag burned again.
Reichstag was an objective. They had been clawing their way toward it for years. Now it was within their grasp. April 30th, 1945. Zhukov gave the order to finish off the enemy at 6.30 that evening. General Weidling, commander of Berlin, gave himself up at 6 o'clock in the morning on May 2nd. By three that afternoon, Weidling's troops had joined him in captivity, 70,000 of them. And then the silence fell. The soldiers had almost forgotten what silence was. not quite the end. The Nazis still held out in Prague with a million troops in central Czechoslovakia and southern Germany. On the 5th of May, the Czechs rose in Prague, bringing their long underground resistance to the Nazis to open confrontation. of Prague, General Patton's third army had halted. The agreement had been that the Soviets should take the city. Marshal Konya's first Ukrainian front had been given the assignment, but it had been fighting near Berlin. a little premature. Prague Radio broadcast an SOS. The Czechs were hopelessly outweighed. Massacre began. Sixth, Konyev's troops wheeled south, striking at the remnants of the German Army Group Center. <laughs> By 
By the afternoon of May the 7th, with German planes constantly overhead, the situation in Prague had become critical. Next day, Konyev's tanks reached the far side of the mountains, north of Prague. Prague was a day's fast driving away. Troops of the Red Army swept into Prague. Marshal Konyev was made an honorary citizen of the Czech capital. The impromptu victory parade included men of the Czechoslovak Corps that had fought alongside the Soviets. Even after they had liberated their own land, the Soviets lost a million men in Eastern Europe. The Czechs laid the Soviet dead near their own, those who had died in the Prague uprising. Racing memories. Year Reich had lasted a mere 12 years. To some, it had been a lifetime. they had found Hitler, but Hitler's body had been burned so badly it was hard to identify. It was immediately apparent that this was Goebbels. He had poisoned himself, his wife and his six daughters. proudest cities in Europe had been gutted.
May 1945, the new order of the Nazis had displaced millions all over Europe. Italians, Russians, Poles, French, Czechs, Yugoslavs. Once doomed to slavery, now they hurried home. joy of victory, the realization finally that the war was over. The Allied military commanders on both fronts accepted the Nazi surrender in two ceremonies, Eisenhower on May 7th in France and Zhukov at midnight on May 8th in Berlin. General Chuikov, the hero of Stalingrad, had also commanded Zhukov's spearhead at Berlin. Starvation hung over Berlin. At first, all there was to eat was what the Red Army provided. Difficulties increased as the Berliners slowly returned to their ruined city. Zhukov appointed General Birzarin, Commandant of Berlin. Bezarin's first orders were for food supplies. Bread, fats, sugar, salt, potatoes. A rationing system was vital. Soviets settled down to their occupation of Berlin. Among them, Lydia Ovcherenko. Who am I? Just an ordinary country girl. I finished high school, then the war began. I fought through the whole war, all of the Ukraine, the Crimea, right here to Berlin. walked among the evidence of the power of his artillery. Without question, Marshal Georgi Zhukov had established himself as preeminent among the Soviet generals. It 
it was Zhukov who supervised the German surrender. May 8, 1945, the Allies assembled to accept the capitulation. British Air Marshal Tedder, Deputy Commander to General Eisenhower. General Carl Spatz, Commander of the U.S. Strategic Air Force. Former Chief of the German High Command, Field Marshal Keitel. eastern suburbs of Karlshorst. At midnight exactly, the formalities began, led by Zhukov. Assembled here are Marshal of the Soviet Union, Georgi Zhukov, Air Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, General Carl Spatz, and General Jean de Latre de Tassigny, Commander-in-Chief of the French Army. The representatives of the German High Command have arrived. I thereby declare the proceedings open and order that the representatives of the German High Command be summoned into the room. Keitel entered first. Do the representatives of the German High Command have in their hands the act of unconditional surrender? Have they read the act? I recommend that they sign it.
there were other signatures. Ordinary soldiers left theirs on the Reichstag. I'm from Moscow. The shortest way home is by way of Berlin. It was their only public comment on the unknown war. Last Battle of the Unknown War. Honoring his pledge to the Western Allies, Stalin sent his armies against the Japanese in Manchuria in August of 1945. In 27 days, they destroyed the mighty Kwantung Army and pushed the last Japanese off the mainland of Asia. 